here with the legend, um, multiple world champion karate, UK's finest, has served this country almost like a diplomat as a soldier would serve in the armed forces. I'm here with the one and only Jeff Thompson. How you doing, sir? I'm good, Terry. How are you? Uh, pretty good. Thank you for, uh, for having me in Manchester. It's a bit different from being in London. Sunny Manchester. <laughs> um, first of all, let's go back in time. Let's revisit the, the, the glory days, so to speak. Uh, your time representing this country as a karate athlete. Uh, what fond memories do you have of those, those good old years? The 80s, Britain's dominance in world karate. Taiwan, 1982, where I was to win double gold and was to begin a dominance that would see British karate dominate world karate for over a decade. When I reflect on it now, and you know, many people say that you, you can forget and you can leave it all behind. I fought the 84 World Championship final two weeks ago as I was just about to catch that second deep sleep. <laughs> it never leaves you. It it's always in that subconscious. And anyone who tells you differently is lying. <sighs> so that's me giving it to you real upfront and personal. <sighs> but at that time, it was a golden era because the traditional intensity of karate was in some way enhanced by what was then a karate competitor or a karate fighter to the advent of the karate athlete. And the karate athlete would do a sub 11 seconds on the track, would go into a boxing gym and do as much work as a boxer and would even be seen in a ballet class as I would be seen doing bar work. It was looking at how you could become faster, stronger in both mind, body and spirit and then behaviorally bring those characteristics as an individual because karate again in its competitive intensity is unique on the friday would be a team of brothers competing for the greatest team sport prize the team gold we were that dominant in that era two per weight category meant you would meet someone that you would die for 24 hours later in the individual final you therefore have to have a unique set of emotional skill sets and a very strong and resilient mind because you need to do justice to yourself to your team and then to yourself again and for me there could be no better feeling at that time as you know when you win it's the ultimate ultimate drug it's the best high in the world and then you try and recreate it and competition is combative chess it's intense it's controlled aggression but to be able to do on the square off the square what the preparation would lead to and putting yourself under immense pressure i think is something as i've said it's life-changing, life-enhancing, and still life-relevant, and something I apply in everything that I do. Um, for the younger guys who are um, looking at this and thinking, well, I wasn't born then, so I don't know who you're talking about. Remind us of some of the uh, legends in the game that fought alongside you or with you, or even against you, uh, UK's finest, or actually the world's finest in that golden era of the 80s that um, we can research. The, the, the golden era of that team of 82, 84, 86, and there was a spine in every successful team. There was a consistent presence of those individuals who simply continue that pursuit of excellence, as I would term that philosophy. philosophy. So you had the Vic Charles, the Pat Mackays, the Jerome Atkinsons, the Jerry Flemings. Um, they very much represented the, the, that original, as it were, currency of grounded, rooted, warriors and i say i believe there are competitors there are fighters there are athletes and there are warriors there were warriors who rep represented that squad and that team as it was to become and then as we saw a period of dominance in the first half of the 80s we saw a new generation the mick salesman the michael etienne the mervyn etiennes they came and added a certain spice a new generational um feel the Wayne Ottos, the Willie Thomases, the Paul Aldersons, all became inspired by our exploits and got some of that, what I call gold dust, that intensity of purpose, intent and will. And we did have a consistent coaching presence of Billy Higgins and T Tiki Donovan. Tiki Donovan, in having that presence from 82 throughout, provided longevity and consistency because he would have known the juniors that were to become the seniors and that blend and mix of having a very competitive environment 
So you had your A squads, your B squads, your junior squads, and there would always be a fight off. And the one secret ingredient of the dominance of the 80s is that nobody's place was guaranteed. Every single pre-train before a world championship, nobody's place was guaranteed. I fought off for the second world championship. I'd had an injury. I was only two weeks back into training and I fought Pat Mackay for my place for the 84 world championships. And you're That's defending world champion. I was a defending world champion, double world champion. So there was no grace or favor. And it worked because we had, I had my own personal philosophy and belief. Once I stood on that rostrum and I stepped off that rostrum, we would get down and enjoy and we'd be back in the streets with the boys who came from the streets and they would celebrate as much as I would. And by time, championships would be biannual every two years, normally be the latter part of the year. So by Christmas, you took your time out. And then as far as I was concerned, those medals were where they needed to be because I wanted more. So your winter training started on the basis of a zero account. And I think that mentality was what made that team unique. We had an incredibly intense, and I think hyper intense currency of talent right the way throughout the categories. And I think that only breeds success. And if you want success, you have to breed success. So nobody took anything for granted. And I think that was, I think some of our best fights were in the pre-training. I always said to have had it archived, I think would have helped serve the current generations who don't know who we are, what we did, what we achieved. Most within the frustration, Vic Charles went to bobsleigh, did other sports. I went to athletics, did fencing. The frustration of not going from world dominance to Olympic gold, and that was always where I wanted to be. There always had to be another level. And I think if you can get your black belt, you can get your Dan grades, you know, that, that, that whole tension between art and its tradition and sport and where we wanted to take it was one of the reasons I found a great deal of resistance in trying to take that sport, not only to its rightful recognition and place, but so it had its rightful reward, recognition and respect. But for the generations past, there's nowhere near, I believe, what should be the archives, what should be the currency, where people would be inspired. I'd say if you vote for Back Pacquiao, you know, you know, if you make a case for him, and if you're a Pacquiao fan, you know, good luck to you, you know. Tiki Donovan was certainly the consistency of presence that knew on the basis of juniors who would make seniors.